On Boxing Day 2004, an enormous earthquake struck off the coast of Indonesia, causing a tsunami up to 30 meters tall to sweep across the Indian Ocean. Over 200,000 people were killed and coastal ecosystems were devastated. In response, the government of Sri Lanka spent $13 million planting new mangrove trees at 23 different sites to act as natural flood defenses. However, by 2017, nine of the 23 sites had no mangroves remaining. Only three had most of their plants remaining. And this isn't uncommon. Large-scale planting projects have high failure rates, and some of them do more harm than good for the climate. Let's talk about why these projects fail, what separates out the successful ones, and introduce you to an exemplary charity, Regreening Africa. Let's get something straight. People love trees, and so do I. I mean, what's not to love? They're beautiful, they provide shade, they're a way of life for some people, and they suck lots of carbon out of the atmosphere. Some people tout tree planting as a major climate solution. Plant lots of trees, suck lots of carbon out of the atmosphere, restore some biodiversity, fix the climate crisis. Initiatives range from team trees to one trillion trees to the 10 billion tree tsunami in Pakistan and the Great Green Wall of China. But many such projects fail. In 2019, volunteers planted 11 million trees in Turkey, setting a Guinness World Record. But less than three months later, up to 90% of the saplings were already dead. Large-scale tree planting in the Philippines has seen a 98% mortality rate. An analysis from Wetlands International concluded that while many tens of millions of euros have been spent on mangrove restoration in recent years, the majority of these restoration projects has failed, with success rates ranging between 15 and 20% a lot of conservation funding has gone to waste. So what caused these failures? Well, according to this paper from 2020, common reasons for failure include low quality seedlings, soil degradation, and unforeseen circumstances during the course of the project. Sure, these all seem reasonable, but there are three other causes identified by the paper that are much more actionable. Firstly, human pressures. Planting failed because activities like cattle grazing and firewood collection that led to deforestation in the first place just carried on. Secondly, conflicting goals from stakeholders. The people running the project and the local population wanted different things. For example, in Nigeria, a project aimed at combating desertification failed because local communities didn't care about the trees planted. They instead looked after the fruiting trees that provided them with food and fuel. And thirdly, duration of projects and how their success was measured. Many projects featured just two years or less of monitoring, nowhere near enough to determine if carbon had been drawn down or biodiversity restored. Trees were planted and then abandoned. But let's say a project doesn't do any of those things. The trees that are planted stay in the ground, they survive. That's a win for the environment, right? Well, not always. On a local scale, planting trees in historic grasslands and savannas can harm the native ecosystem, planting trees reduces water availability for other plants, and monoculture plantations, which are all the same species, create entire ecosystems that are highly vulnerable to pests and diseases. And that's not even to mention the impact on humans, such as the loss of land availability for other uses, such as agriculture, the erosion of indigenous ways of life, and the general reek of neocolonialism. But perhaps most importantly, considering what we're ultimately trying to do here, planting new trees doesn't always net cool the climate. You see, the darker an object is, the more light it absorbs. We call this albedo. If you cover a light object illuminated by the sun with a dark object, suddenly more energy is being absorbed and you've increased the local temperature. A paper published this year found that where trees were much darker than the land they covered, even accounting for the carbon they suck out of the atmosphere, they have a net warming influence on the climate. Anywhere on this figure that's red or orange indicates somewhere where planting new trees net warms the planet. Fortunately, most tree planting doesn't take place in these red regions, but as the paper points out, even there, the climate mitigation potential of tree planting has been overestimated, especially in one particularly egregious and very influential paper. There's this albedo effect that you also have to take into account. But despite everything I've said, all of these negatives, some tree planting projects have been successful and they have delayed the rate of global warming. Afforestation and woodland restoration are valuable tools in the adaptation to and mitigation of climate change. I guess we'll come back to that point. What I've been getting at is that it's not as simple as I'll just chuck money at people who are planting trees. That'll help. Please 
only support a tree planting project if it's located somewhere with a net cooling influence, like in a temperate or tropical broadleaf forest, it's comprised of a mix of indigenous tree species planted by an organization with a proven track record who have clear objectives, including tree survival rates, who are meaningfully engaging with local communities in planning, in addressing land use that originally led to deforestation, and using existing well-respected local institutions to protect the trees, and who have pledged to at least 10 years of monitoring. In short, a project should be run by experts and tailored to the specifics of its natural environment. To not do those things is to invite failure. But the interesting thing is that according to many experts in the field, the best tree restoration scheme is the one that doesn't happen. This paper sets out 10 reasons why tree planting on a large scale isn't always that great. I'd encourage you to read the whole thing. There's lots of interesting stuff in this paper that we don't normally hear about in the media. But let me just read to you the punchline. Increasing the carbon stored in ecosystems is an important element of any climate mitigation strategy. Unfortunately, the current focus on large-scale tree planting initiatives is, at best, a distraction from this goal. We suggest instead that efforts to implement natural climate solutions should focus on policies that support the restoration efforts of small farmers, hunters, and pastoralists, and hinder the displacement of ecosystems with export-oriented commodity agriculture. Once developed, people-centered climate solutions will be the most effective natural climate solutions because they will align conservation goals and the interests of the rural people responsible for managing ecosystems. And with that in mind, let me introduce you to Just Dig It. Well, actually, no, I won't introduce them. I'm Stuart Taylor, and I'm UK Country Director for Just Dig It. And our mission really is to communicate and activate 350 million smallholder farmers in sub-Saharan Africa to regreen their own land in as short a time as possible. Now, to be extremely clear, this video isn't sponsored by Just Dig It. They didn't ask me to make it or anything like that. I've just worked with them in the past, and I really rate what they do. But what exactly is that? We determine the right land that is, in our view, appropriate uh, for regreening efforts. And that means a look at the rainfall, it means a look at the um, geology, the land use to date. And there's a number of techniques that we use. We, we're known for two techniques, really, but there's probably four or five others. The one we're most well known for is, is basically rainwater harvesting, which is digging semicircular booms there, five meters in diameter. We pay local people to, to dig them because it's their land, they get economic income from that. And then when it rains, you've broken open the top layer, the rain fills these giant puddles and slowly soaks in. Often we do put some seeds in those, in those booms just to, to get going, to give nature a helping hand. There'll be local seeds, local plants. And once you've got some of the perennial grasses, anchored in, then everything can get going because when it then rains again, instead of the rainwater causing gullies and flowing away, taking off topsoil, uh, the rainwater soaks in properly, refills the aquifers and promotes further life to get generated. The second thing we're, we're, we think is arguably probably going to be um, bigger in terms of impact and that is restoring trees. And what we do here is we don't do any digging, we don't do any planting. We basically talk to farmers and educate them on a very simple and accessible method of pruning small bushes that already exist on their property, on their smallholder farms. And we, we show them how to, with these simple and, and accessible techniques, to restore trees just with a machete. Teach them to protect the trees so they don't accidentally cut it down. Keep pruning it, and in three to four years, often, it's so fertile down there that these trees become three, four, five meter trees again, and thus become productive. And that's the second main thing, and we're already over 18 million trees that have been restored. But we, as I say, we don't do any planting. We, we encourage them to do it. They're not under any obligation to to do it, but once they see the benefits, often there's no holding them back, they, they, they don't stop. But on this specific technique, it's purely education, and we teach champion farmers uh, to teach other people. So that, you know, train the trainer kind of thing, and uh, they're more likely to believe their cousin than they are someone from just dig it. But you have to get the ball rolling uh, initially. And it's, it's really quite incredible, and um, the uptake has been beyond our expectations. And our job, our urgency is to, is to get through to as many farmers as we can because we all benefit, wherever you live on the planet, from more trees. If you would like to support a charity that is about trees, the climate, and re-greening, then I think Just Dig It is an excellent choice. Despite not planting new trees, they meet those criteria that I mentioned previously, and they tailor each new project to the specifics of its site. There's a link to them and their fundraising page down in the description. 
I don't want you to come away from this video with the perception that tree planting is universally bad. It can work. I mean, this video has been filmed in a forest where I planted a tree 24 years ago. Clearly, if done right, the trees can survive. They can suck carbon out of the atmosphere and they can slow global warming. But it's no silver bullet. It's nuanced and it's not how we get out of the climate crisis. Ah, that's what that was about. Even when done right, tree planting doesn't address the root cause of the climate crisis, our dependence on fossil fuels, and our unsustainable emissions of greenhouse gases. Tree planting is not a substitute for taking rapid and drastic actions to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Certainly, planting trees in formerly forested lands is one of the best options to offset a portion of anthropogenic carbon emissions, but increasing global tree cover will only constitute a fraction of the carbon reductions needed to keep temperature increases below one and a half to two degrees Celsius. So if you are considering supporting a tree planting project, that's great. Just please do your homework. Does the project meet these criteria? And if you do choose to support such a project, please don't think that gives you license to carry on with a high carbon lifestyle. Trees are amazing, yes, and they do lots for us, but they can't undo all of the damage that we are doing to the atmosphere. We need to be a friend to the trees, but we also need to stop being the problem in the first place. Solving problems is all about practice. The more problems you solve, the better you get at it. And skills are transferable. The more maths problems you solve, the better you get at solving any problem that involves some kind of logic. In fact, if you spent a few minutes each day solving problems designed by very clever people, you could learn about a new topic and improve your problem-solving abilities in the rest of your life. Well, that's exactly what Brilliant.org, who have kindly sponsored this video, is all about. They offer courses in maths, science, and programming where you learn by doing, introducing you to new concepts in fun, bite-sized lessons built around expertly crafted exercises and interactive elements. I've worked with Brilliant for a long time now because I genuinely love what they've built. If I was still at school or university, I would absolutely be using their service to support my learning in the classroom. And since graduation, I have used it to introduce myself to new topics like a little bit of chemistry and how large language models work. It's a fantastic service, it's well made, and I think it's worth checking out. It's completely free to sign up and you get full access to everything Brilliant has to offer for 30 days at brilliant.org slash Simon Clark. If you like it, then signing up at that link also gives you a 20% discount and directly supports this channel. That link again was brilliant.org slash Simon Clark. With thanks to Brilliant for sponsoring this video and for being, well, brilliant. Thank you for watching. I hope that you enjoyed the video. If you did, please do the YouTube pleasantries, drop a like, a comment, you know the drill by now. If you enjoyed the video and you would like to help me make more videos about how the climate crisis intersects with our lives, then consider supporting me on Patreon. Patrons get early access to videos, they get exclusive content, including a behind the scenes vlog every month, and producer tier patrons and higher, including the names on screen right now, my executive producer and Henry Cavill and Steven Spielberg tier patrons, get to vote on a video topic a month. If you'd like to join them, then there's a link down there in the description. If you'd like to watch something else from me, then here's two videos I prepared earlier. And that just leaves me to say thank you once again for watching. I hope you enjoyed. I'll see you in the next one.